Hey, just let me know when we are starting, yeah? Yeah, yeah, Karthik will tell us when we are starting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to today's uh, session. Uh, I have with me uh, Tarun Mehta. Tarun is uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Ether Energy. Tarun is uh, every bit as young as he looks, and uh, you know is uh, is one of the poster boys of uh, uh, India's foray into electric vehicles. Right? Uh, he's uh, I can I can think of so many adjectives uh, to describe Tarun, but the one that stands out for me. Uh, is that he's very mature, mature way beyond his age. And in every conversation I've had with him, I've come away feeling very, very impressed. So I'm sure uh, you guys are looking forward to the session as well. Just for some background, uh, Tarun uh, has a, a degree in uh, engineering design from uh, IIT Madras. He graduated in 2012. Uh, and a year later, uh, started Aether Energy. Aether was started in 2013. Uh, but I think he's... Uh, you know, have, wanting to be an entrepreneur has been uh, a, a strong feeling with him for uh, for a while, I think, before he started Aether uh, as early as uh, second year in college. So, uh, you know, at some level, some of you are, uh, many of you are undergraduate students thinking about uh, what might be a good career option. And I think Tarun's a good example of the difference you can make if you uh, uh, take up entrepreneurship as a career option. We will talk about that in a lot more. Uh, what I want to start with, uh, Tarun, is you know you started the, you founded the company, you named it, uh, or at least in your head, you always had the name Aether Energy, even when you were in college. And uh, how you started off was by looking at uh, uh, batteries and battery management and uh, battery chemistry and how to optimize batteries. Uh, so my first uh, question to you is, how did you go from there uh, to building a scooter? Why not say, okay, I will work on battery management, supply that to electric companies, or uh, build the dashboard, uh, electronics and firmware, supply that to electric bikes. How did you take that giant leap, a pretty audacious leap in my mind, uh, and go all the way and say, no, I'm just going to build uh, uh, the complete scooter? How, how did you make that leap? So, uh, PK, thanks for having me over. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, we did consider, at the very start, we actually were considering only building battery packs. Uh, it just makes sense, right? You're a new startup and you're not funded um, in the automotive sector, which has nothing but giants. There are no startups in this world, uh, at least not back then. Um, so it makes sense that you know, you, you'll go for a small niche and you will you will start to sort of build your nice kingdom there. And that's what we also originally thought uh, for at least a while. Uh, but I think it was, um, for us, it was really my co-founder. Um, who, who I, I pulled him in by pitching in that we should build battery packs and it'll be very exciting. Uh, and you know, that way we'll be able to build an energy company and, and, and he bought into it. But the minute he joined it, he turned around and said, listen, who will he sell these batteries to? And I was like, let's do it question. Uh, like maybe we can sell it to people who already have electric vehicles. We can go and do a retrofit job there. And we kind of thought about it and realized, holy shit, there are no numbers. Like people don't buy electric vehicles. Who will you do retrofits for? And we said, okay, maybe we can become suppliers to larger OEMs. And we're like, would we qualify ourselves as suppliers to a large OEM? So we're like, no, nobody's going to accept us as a supplier either. So we're like, listen, there is no business case in path one, and there is no credibility in path two. So if there's no credibility anyways, might as well go with a slightly more audacious goal. And if people don't think we're credible enough to build battery packs, maybe we should just build the full vehicle. That's an easier answer, and it least solves problem one. Because then we don't have to sell the batteries to individual companies, and we can just build the entire product, and the battery goes there. So I know it's a very, it's a very uh, lame, lame answer, but honestly, that, that that's a real answer. We're like, who's who's gonna buy the battery? We just okay, fine, we'll build the vehicle. You know, you know, Tarun, I I have to digress a bit and tell you an interesting uh, story. Uh, you know, when when MS Dhoni was uh, was still in, uh, you know, he still hadn't played for India. He was still playing for uh, Bihar and was one of the junior players. There was this incredible chase they had to uh, go after. And then the senior partner came and said, you know, will you give me strike? So he said, if I give you strike, will you guarantee we win? And the guy said, no, no, how can I guarantee? He said, if you anyway, you can't guarantee, I might as well keep the strike. So, <laughs> so this, this sort of fits in a similar mode for me. It's like, yeah, anyway, if they won't buy, we might as well go ahead and uh, build the full thing. I think it's, uh, it's very audacious and uh, it's paid off well. So, you know, full congratulations to you. Great, great work to you and Swapnal. Really well done. 
so the next uh, uh, you know question i had there was uh, okay now that you say okay we're going to build the scooters we are also at an interesting time right uh, with uh, with electric vehicles uh, maybe some of it has to do with electric vehicles some of it might just have to do with the way the industry is transforming itself you know it's not just the type of engine you have it's just not internal internal combustion was its uh, uh, battery uh, 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 or, or an electric vehicle it's also what used to be a speedometer and uh, maybe an odometer and a simple fuel gauge is is now a tablet on wheels what used yep. to be a dealership that you would walk into is now an experience center tesla has sort of uh, laid out the ground in terms of what all you can do in the experience that you give to somebody that uses an electric vehicle so how is uh, ather taking the lead uh, here in india with some of these concepts so i think uh, and you and you will i think tesla has been the first one to sort of uh, uh, lay the foundation here for the rest of the industry uh, we saw it too but i, I would say we saw it probably more as engineers than 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 any real business strategy uh, for, so so the way it evolved for us was uh, way back in uh, late 2013 when we were just just starting the company and thinking about things and we originally thought of building a battery pack um we wanted to build a battery management system and we had the option of either building a battery management system or buying one um and sorry i'm taking a little bit of digression but that probably might help you see how we took this decision and how we started seeing the pieces fall in place um initially um we considered buying a bms off the shelf uh, because that is easier and faster and there are tons of them are available at cheap rates but back in 2013 um an analog bms was cheap let's say 30 35 dollars uh, a piece a digital bms was about 5 to 10 times more expensive with the same functionality uh, or obviously not the same functionality because it's digital so it can pinpoint far more accurately which cell is going off instead of just telling you something's off and we were like we're not sure why digital is so expensive we should dive in understand more and a way of doing that was to actually just build our own bms so we built our own digital bms and we looked at the bill of materials and we realized holy shit this will bms has the same bill of materials as an analog bms um so clearly there is some jol happening in the background where companies are charging a premium because they just can charge one so we said uh, okay we're going to build our own digital bms and um, the case for the digital bms internally was that it just is generating so much data right your your understanding of the battery pack just becomes so much more denser and so much better the minute it's a digital and not an analog piece And I would say that was probably the starting piece for us to start seeing the the transition in automotive from a digital and analog perspective. We started noticing that listen, with, with every piece that is going digital, the amount of data that it starts generating is is just phenomenal. And and by digital and analog, now I'm taking a more um, generous description that I'm saying everything pre world is analog and everything new is digital. But basically, electric uh, everything on the electric power train. we as we started building most of it in the house whether it's the battery or the bms or the charger or the dashboard uh, we started working very deeply on the motor um, we realized all of this is generating tons of data that the previous world uh, let's say a petrol scooter never did now what do you do with this data uh, well if you have so much data you can show it to the end user right you can have a very nice ui for it which means you should have a really nice interface which means you should really consider having a touch screen right hey but the minute you have a touch screen or other minute you have a display the display can be touch and if it is touch suddenly it's a two way interaction right yet the user is not just seeing data but the user can start interacting with it now what do you do if you want to interact with the vehicle oh that means you can get into the settings very really deeply you can customize it a lot more you can uh, push upgrades onto the vehicle you can uh, uh, do a lot of learning your algorithms can keep improving as time goes by and suddenly you realize that listen all of this was impossible in the petrol world and it's all coming free of cost and electric on a petrol scooter if we, if we, if you even want to add a keyless as a feature there's like probably 1500 rupees worth of additional hardware that you have to throw right uh, if you have to track gps if you have to add gps like like you have to add a battery you have to add communication layers you have to add an extra processor then you have to like package all of it then you have to worry about emi emi emc separate this is like a 5000 rupee like hardware to add on top of it on on an electric vehicle you want to add a gps thing like everything's there just just add that one gps module 8 dollars done right and that's when you realize that with electric vehicles connected vehicles come as a free of as as free with it right and suddenly it made so much sense that that's why tesla was doing it like that's why tesla went so quickly on the autonomous path because the computing power is is right in there and 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 the electric power train is just laid out the uh, groundwork for it so beautifully um so that's what we started doing i i think it was not really 
well thought through. It was really more of an engineering path that took us to realizing that there's a business strategy or there's a product strategy around connected vehicles. Uh, it really came from there. But once it once it became obvious, I, I think everybody in the company suddenly realized it, like almost at the same time, magically. And suddenly our business teams brought in connectivity as a big, 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 big layer onto the entire ownership experience. So suddenly, you know, oh, the user has to have a mobile app, the mobile app has to be connected with the vehicle, our servicing has to be back and connected, our uh, pre-sales, post-sales, marketing, everything has to be connected, everything speaks to each other. And it's like, like we've jumped a few steps beyond just the SAP migrations into, into a very, very, very connected uh, company already. And um, so, yeah, I, I think, uh, Zooming back into Ether, we, we, we definitely um, fairly deeply plugged into that that worldview. A product and experience is deeply plugged into it. And I think that's because we, we made a pure electric bet. Uh, and, and that opened up the way to all of it very naturally. OK, OK, that's good. You want to also talk about uh, uh, you know the dealership versus the experience center? Yeah, yeah. So um, they are, so OK, so the product philosophy was different. We are building a better product. We are building a more powerful product. Uh, and we had this connected part, and we had this electric part, and the electric is so different from petrol. And, and we're like, how will a dealer explain it? Right? I don't even. We don't even know what questions people are going to ask us. Right? How can we? Like, it's 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 not like we are we're dissing on dealers. We are going down the dealership route now. But in phase one, we're like, I don't know what to tell a dealer. Like, the poor dealer will have to sell it the way they sell a petrol scooter. Like, that's all they know. That that's only comparable. And you can't sell it this way. And like, I'm 100% sure without having enough data for it that you can't sell it that way. Okay. So we didn't jump into an experience center straight away. We used the two years, two, three years before launch to we and we did a lot of open house events. So what, what we would do is uh, we had a very nice office uh, here in Bangalore um, and we would invite people over on typically Saturdays, uh, Saturdays or Sundays, and we'd spend three, four hours, right? And we'd put a prototype right in the middle of the office, invite customers, uh, 50, 60, 70 of them, and spend three, four hours talking to them, right? Just sort of getting a flavor of, you know, what seems to excite people. Right? And it's okay, the entire market need not fall in love with it. But what do the earlier adopters also care about? Right? Is it the looks of the vehicle? Is it the performance of the vehicle? Is it the touch screen? Is it the dashboard? Is it the, the, the smart features? Uh, is it our story? Like maybe maybe the startup story is very exciting for them. And that was just beautiful. I think we did like 20 such events before we actually started selling the scooter. And we learned so much that that essentially became our first playbook as to what we want to do in our own retail. Right? And it was pretty obvious to us that we can't do it in, in a dealership. Uh, it is a very different experience. So we set up our own retailership, retail uh, outlet, which we call an experience center. And we focused it very differently. We realized that for newcomers, new buyers, they already want to buy it. Either. OK. Um, they're already like set. Like they're like, listen, I want to buy an electric, and I want to buy a great electric product. You are the only guys that qualify, by definition. So I'm only already buying you. OK. Now I want to spend more time with you to become an evangelist. I already believe in the tech. I already believe in the story. I believe this is the future. But just sort of engage enough with me for me to go out and convince 100 other people that this is the future. And that's what we saw as an opportunity. That, listen, we, are not, we don't need to sell. Like, people are anyways coming to us. Okay? We need to make sure that we can, we, we don't set up a sales outlet, but we set up an education outlet. Right? Like, we need to like, sort of tell them how beautifully this was all put together. We need to tell them you know, what was the idea behind it. We need to put up pictures of the entire office. We need to pick. We need to put up naked vehicles because these guys really want to go into the detail of the engineering. They want to understand why an aluminum frame, why not a steel frame, right? They want to really understand, like, tell me what kind of data that you guys collect. What is the future with it? It's okay. Even if you have zero actual application of their data today, that's fine. But tell me how this can become cool three years later. And we suddenly realized what we need is hence an experience center because we are an almost, I should call it education center. We need to educate more and more of the evangelists about why you should be an evangelist for us and this tech, right? Um, that's why that's why I went about setting up the experience center. Oh, that's actually very fascinating to uh, listen to. You know, it's, it's 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 always interesting to listen to an engineer talk about marketing. There's so <laughs> such logical construction of all arguments. <laughs> and you think, oh, okay, that's uh, it, you know, it appeals to me, and I'm sure it appeals to a lot of the audience as well. So that it's possible to logically construct. Okay. You know, maybe some of it happens after the event, but at least still there's there's logic uh, uh, to the whole thing. Uh, very nice, uh, Tarun. Very nice. Uh, you know, let's let's talk about uh, uh, the scooter itself uh, uh, for a bit and the, the supply chain. So one thing is, uh, you know, if you're building a, a new scooter, still let's say uh, a scooter with uh, an IC engine, a petrol scooter, 
then at least you don't have to worry about supply chain so much but the minute you say no no it's a new type of scooter one you're uh, signing up for a whole lot of new parts that nobody's uh, sourced before so there is the challenge of uh, sourcing them that's one part the other thing is you know if i'm building a petrol scooter petrol bunks already exist right and no but nobody who buys the scooter expects me to worry about the petrol bunk right if i'm uh, uh, let's say tvs selling a scooter nobody comes to tvs and says okay tell me where all you've uh, invested in petrol bunks that that question is simply not going to arise but once you talk about uh, an electric bike i would think uh, charging station somewhere becomes an integral part of uh, the infrastructure creation that's expected of the electric vehicle maker right that oh, okay you know if you're selling me an electric vehicle somewhere you will guarantee that the charging infrastructure is going to be in place right mm. so i think the supply chain problem is actually very very complex because there's one whatever there is to do with the scooter itself that's one challenge and then there is the infrastructure you need to set up for a day to day use so mm. how have you handled these what challenges how did you overcome them so it you're talking about two parts they're talking about the supply chain and the infrastructure um so our going in view was that uh, whatever does not exist uh, so first we'll try and see if something exists and it makes sense and whatever does not exist we'll just start building it um it is very simple world you keeps everybody fairly focused and fairly clear uh, and that's what we pretty much did so for example the batteries do not exist so we are building battery packs bms do not exist so we started building battery bms systems charges do not exist so we the first entire generation of chargers ether built them in house uh, the dashboards touch screens do not exist so we we put up a uh a mirror team together and we actually started building the dashboards ourselves so the first entire wave of partners that we brought on board were really built to built to print right which is an easier partnership to create as opposed to a proprietary component maker like if you had to go down the classic oem route the classic classic oem route is to say hey i'm putting a vehicle together but where is my motor coming from where is my charger coming from where is my battery coming from where is my dashboard coming from where is who's adding the software for this uh, dashboard who's adding the firmware for the rest of the components right i need to stitch together we need to integrate all of these guys beautifully as really deeply integrated partners it's not a wrong philosophy it's just that with so much new tech it it would take it would take you a decade to start stitching them up and that's the honest answer because they don't have experience they don't have any other customers except you they're not going to jump on board with with uh design investments in in a new sector so our going in view was that listen let's take all the big pieces and let's just build them in house uh and let's just take them to production with manufacturing partners for most of them um for classic automotive components like brakes suspensions plastic panels paintings uh there's a beautiful supply chain that already exists which is probably the most competent globally uh which is tapping to them uh, and i think that's where the investment from a strategic partner like hero kind of helped because it 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 christened uh christened some credibility onto us and 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 made suppliers trust us more uh, and i'm very grateful to everybody for that um so between a combination of that and, and owning a lot of ip in house to today ether has about just about under 50 patents on on the ip that we created in house um so between a combination of in house ip and uh, uh, strategic partnerships i think we were able to stitch together a supply chain reasonably well uh, the supply chain has evolved quite a lot over the last few years as the company has grown but uh, i think we, we that, that's how it evolved on the infrastructure side um for maybe the first year we kept thinking that yeah we'll look for charging infrastructure partners but just like the supply chain side we found nobody in in the first year so we changed the story and by i think mid 2015 or early 2015 we started saying that listen infrastructure is going to be our thing so we're just going to uh, we're going to call this ether grid and we're going to roll out an infrastructure even before we roll out our first vehicles and we're going to roll out in two phases one is going to be consumer side and other is going to be public side so uh we uh today we have installed a charging point in every single customer's uh, consumer's house at least it is the user's house right so we have done a fairly large ops work here rolling out thousands of charging points across bangalore and chennai in every single customer's house like literally 99% plus success rate today uh and in parallel we have also uh, started installing our own public fast chargers with the same view we didn't want to wait for other infrastructure to catch up uh so we just started installing them on our own uh and they actually work as one of our important marketing mediums today yeah no that i, I totally agree uh, we actually we have a, several people in my community that own the ether so you know every time i see one of those charging points i think some day I, i will also pick up one so let's <laughs> see uh that's uh, that's good uh, uh, tarun so the next question i had no again maybe on the business side of uh, uh, scooters 
see one is uh, and is something that we also face in uh, uh, our line quite a bit is what does your customer compare your product against right uh, so you know let's say suppose somebody <coughs> says oh, okay you know i'll at the early adopters are totally bought in with the idea of the electric uh, concept i totally mm. get that but as you start to go into the mass uh, market where you go from the thousands a month to the 10000s or 100000s a month then you're really entering the space where it's going to be okay scooter a was a scooter b was a scooter c and yep. so many different parameters come into play right so do you see your customers uh, comparing the ether against something like the honda activa honda activa maybe retails at 60000 or so so price point that's 40 45% cheaper than uh, than the uh, than the ether scooter or do you see them viewing it as no you know uh, the scooter uh, market needs to have categories and Uh, they play in different categories how do you see that uh, comparison playing out as uh, product enters truly enters the mass market so i think first of all most people do compare this to a scooter and not to some other fancy new kind of a category it's 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 at the end of the day a scooter and has to do what a scooter is supposed to do so people do look at the riding quality people do look at the uh, the feel the acceleration the, the storage space uh can they fit in a cylinder on in the front of the scooter nobody guys a cylinder but everybody tests for that um so all the good stuff happens but equally i think um sure there are people who want to buy an activa and will compare this the price point to an activa uh but two things are happening first the scooter segment the scooter category is starting to uh uh segment itself much more and more Uh, so see in the past for the longest time this entire scooter space has been basically plenty put on the activa and its clothes okay there's been very there, there have been some pioneers but they've been very few and with very limited volume at the very very peripheries of the sector right everybody's been just a mad rush to sort of recreate the activa experience again and and get a buy uh, get a share of that beautiful pie uh, and that's because the market's been exploding and there's no time to innovate experiment everybody's just been in a rush to scale up volumes but if you look at the motorbike segment it has seen some immense segmentation over the last 20 years right and i i i would put a lot of credit uh, give a lot of credit to bajaj bajaj pulsar that initially brought in all that innovation and and and, and brought in new category uh, and then royal enfield and then a lot of others who came in so today in a motorbike segment you have a product from a 60000 rupees all the way to several lakhs Similarly, I think the scooter space we are starting to see early signs of segmentation come in, and people, uh, especially urban customers, are starting to buy a more differentiated product. And then that's where Ether can stand out. Uh, also, second thing that's happened is an Activa is no longer sixty. A base Activa is somewhere close to eighty plus, and a one twenty five cc Activa is ninety six thousand rupees. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. I, I think my price points are all maybe many, many months or many years old now. I didn't know the Activa was that expensive now. Good yeah. to know. Uh, you know my my daughter's going to ask me one pretty soon i think so i better start totally thinking about this for a process <laughs> yeah i should i will i will 100% sorry for that sorry for the shameless uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, 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 let's talk about investment uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, tarun you know one of the things uh, again you've done many many things well uh, one of those things that you've done well is uh, is raise money in a in a difficult environment i, I don't think uh, India is an easy place to raise uh, money, even for uh, the best of ideas. And you've managed to raise close to a hundred million dollars, almost seven hundred crores uh, uh, to date, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? right. And um, one, you know, one question is: If you go back to 2013, did you think you would need seven hundred crores? Was it, uh, you know, if, if somebody asked you then, what number would you have come up with? I'm just curious to know what uh, your thoughts then were. And uh, you know, just uh, continuing on that game a little more. If you had to go back to 2013 and redo this a bit, what are the things you would do differently? Is it does it take 700 crores to take a scooter to a mass market, or uh, what? What? What's your take there? So back in 2014, I thought it'll take 15 crores, not 700. <laughs> so that's the answer. Simple. Um, I don't think I was very right. I think I was off by a bit. Um, and what would I do differently? I, so does it take 700 crores? I think it doesn't take 700 crores to launch a, a launch a scooter in the Indian market. Uh, it does take a lot of money to launch an electric scooter in the Indian market. Uh, but I think it takes a lot of money uh, for probably because of what we have done, or maybe even more, um, to, to 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 do an in ecosystem play. So, so we are not trying to just launch a product. Like if you look at our strategy, 
we are also looking at the infrastructure side. We are also looking at the supply chain side. We are looking at the technology side. Uh, so we don't want to be just building a scooter. We see an opportunity to to kickstart and and be the leader in the entire EV category, the entire EV space in India, not category, in the entire EV space in India. And that is a different approach. So you could fast track your product to a market timeline dramatically by choosing to not do any of this technology that we spend time on. I would say after four and a half years that we took to launch the first product, well, 75% of the time went in trading tech, right? As opposed to just building a product. So you could probably skip all of it and, and probably 70% of the money and, and launch a product for maybe like 20, 30 million, 20, 30 million. But if you want to put the, uh, a, a unique proprietary tech, uh, which gives you a, a significant advantage, a differentiated enough experience, that's that's more expensive, and that that's more upfront investment. Then that's what Ethos money is gone in. What would I do differently? I would say, if I would go back in time, I would spend a lot more time um, doing budgeting. Uh, and I'll tell you why. That's not to penny pinch, and that's not to sort of control costs better. But I think as as you go down this path of you know three four five years launch of first product, and, and you're making investments in so many things, um, spending time in budgeting uh, gives you repeated repeated like you know quarterly repeat uh, view on to what is it that you're spending your time and effort on and and budgeting is the is the most objective way to bring that out because if you do budgeting exercise very thoroughly and and you and you kind of uh, uh, do audits on your kind of you do reviews very frequently which and i don't think we've done a lot of those in the past honestly uh, you start understanding that holy shit like that's the amount of money going into this this one thing that you want to do is going to be consuming 40% of our resources over the next 18 months. Um, and I think budgeting, I, I think I, I used to have a very simplistic view on budgeting that it's, it's only about controlling costs. I think I think very differently now. I think budgeting is not about controlling costs, but it's all about uh, understanding your capital allocation. And so if the one thing I would do differently is, is, is right from my first year, start spending more time on budgeting. No, I, I again, I totally agree. I think, uh, you know, the only thing that's true with budgets is that money always gets spent. There's no yes. confidence revenue comes in, but spending targets always get met. So it's important to keep looking at those spending targets as often as you can. Something that, uh, you know, I also totally uh, uh, believe in. And, you know, we all work with a very uh, constrained runway, right? So it's, it's important to keep uh, at very regular intervals, keep looking at that runway, keep looking at that spend. Uh, totally agree with that uh, point. Uh, I think uh, those were the early questions I had. Let me quickly look through the Google Sheets. Uh, Tarun, just hang on with me a minute. Yeah. I'm going to see. Yes, uh, one minute, PK. I'll just turn uh, on the lights. Just give me a second. Uh, Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so um, you know there are multiple classes of uh, questions, uh, uh, Tarun. So I'll start with the education one again. Mm. One is, uh, you know, is something I also hear a lot. Uh, how much value does the IIT tag add uh, uh, to to whatever you do? And you know, let's say you're not from uh, uh, the IIT, right? Mm. Uh, you know, how how do you chart your course, right? What, what's your uh, uh, What's your take, uh, given your experience as an IITian, and uh, what would you advise to somebody who's not uh, a part of that institution? So I think um, the IIT tag, um, I'm not sure it adds a lot of value, to be honest. Uh, like you think it does, but honestly, the people who put a lot of value to it uh, don't end up being really helpful. Uh, so that, that's a funny part, right? Like in absolute terms, yes, sure, there will be 75% of the people who will value it. But the problem is 99% of the people are not helpful. So, and unfortunately, 75% of the people are there. So that's the thing about the ID tag. But I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, I'm not going to discuss completely because I will have to acknowledge that there is a benefit of it. And the benefit is, as, as we have said over, over, over years, um, it's in the network. Um, I think um, sometimes you and and for us, for example, 
the fact that we we could take incubation at iit madras though it's open to everybody but obviously if you are an idm alum it helps i think back in 2014 it was helpful why primarily i would say because we were able to find our first seed capital which is 25 lakhs um primarily because we were hanging around in the campus and we happened to bump into an alum who was there to give a talk and he had 10 minutes free time and i had my laptop open so i ended up pitching um so in a very weird way the the id tag didn't help but the id network kind of paid off immediately right uh, even after that for the next funding round it it didn't really help because such and many didn't look at the id tag uh, it was a cold mail but even before that to the build up of it the 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 network did help in the early days uh but the biggest help that i think i do any good engineering college would provide is any good college would provide is the network from where you will hire i think that becomes a very robust network um a lot of the first 20 30 people came from a network that we knew um many of them were idians but many of them were not but it all came from the same network like like the networks that we grew while we were in college for me for example my co-founder came from my hostel right and i think i think that's that's got to be a relationship that you can absolutely trust absolutely build on and that's not going to happen easily with with a new person so i'm not sure if i should really call it iit but i would say uh, the advantage of starting up from a network that you know uh, can't be understated and iit just happens to have a strong network uh, among all the colleges out there got it got it so Uh, you know just building on that little more again i i, I agree with uh, uh, everything you said tarun my experience has been the same uh, to mm-hmm. somebody that doesn't have that network what 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 would your advice be what would you say oh here are a couple of things maybe you can do maybe these are events you can go to what, is there anything you would uh, give by way of advice to somebody that doesn't have that network today uh, so i would say there are certain events that that really help you find tremendously strong folks i will again starting up if you're looking at starting up in a space where it requires you to build something so what i saw though i was not a part of the network directly but my co-founder was and way too many of our starting founding team members were was the fsa network so fsa is this group where uh, it, it's called formula it's formula sa where college uh, engineering college students get together to build a race car in college right and then they go for international competitions or domestic competitions it it really ends up filtering a lot of people with a tremendous respect for building with their hands right and and people who genuinely have a joy of building uh so it's an incredibly strong filter i would say like it's probably the finest filter available for identifying people who can build who can take a lot of hard work take a lot of rigor um so and the good news is i don't think iit iits are the best fsa colleges teams out there i think the best fsc teams are actually sitting outside the iits because yeah, I, yeah. because so many of the iits are just going into banks right uh so so i think uh, and 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 a ridiculously high number of people for our founding team came from a non iit background but i think the strongest uh, qualifier for eighth in the starting case was not iit at all what was fsc by far by far Okay. 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 Uh, I would say if you're an engineering college student, FSA is a tremendous place to find a network, and it's a network that spans across the country. You will mm-hmm. discover brilliant people from other places that you will start getting to know, and you might end up starting with them. Uh, you will probably end up pulling them uh, uh, later when you start up as as an early D member, or you could end up joining them. And there is this FSA, the other robotic events, but but FSA is the strongest that comes to my mind right now. Okay. 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 Good. Good. Um. okay so there is this you know there is this other uh, comment that's usually uh, that's that's made a lot right uh, which is scooters versus bikes and are scooters the slower cousin to the bikes and mm-hmm. or do this you know are they just different or uh, like apples and oranges that you don't compare them each has its own place or do you keep comparing them and say no no scooter is the weaker cousin uh, scooter is something my dad used to ride not something that i ride right uh, how do you see scooters evolving what what is your take on Do you think okay scooters are going to be the city commute vehicle and bikes are something that will take the touring space how do you see two wheeler space playing out uh, going forward 
So in the city, scooters are winning hands down. Uh, more than 50% of the new two-wheeler sales are scooters now in most major cities. Uh, so scooters are winning. Uh, but also, I would say scooters and bikes are just different. Uh, they're not really. You, you don't. You, you don't um, go out uh, looking to buy a scooter and accidentally end up buying a bike. It never happens. Okay. It doesn't happen. Yeah, I was thinking of buying an Activa, but I don't know what happened. And suddenly, I'm sitting with this Royal Enfield. Never happens. Okay. You want to buy a Royal Enfield? You want to buy a Royal Enfield. Okay, simple. Uh, you want to buy Honda Activa? You want to buy Honda Activa because you know what? Like you want your entire family to be able to ride comfortably, right? And or you know you don't want to ride a 150 cc bike with clutches and gears in Bangalore traffic. You want something more simple, more easy, more comfortable, and that's just a scooter, right? So I think that's just very different. Um, the customers are not super interchangeable. There is some overlap, but not very heavy, and. Um, I think uh, there's a new category emerging in scooters, which is uh, a little bit more sporty. Uh, I think DBS and Tox have seen phenomenal success with it. So is Aprilia SRC. Uh, Ada 450 itself and our new product 40X sits squarely there, which is a sports scooter, right? And but what does that mean by that is it's not meant to compete with the bike, but it can match the acceleration of the best bikes that you can buy at that price point, right? And it still brings the convenience of a scooter. So there's a new, new category emerging that makes a lot of sense for um, young two-wheeler users, right? Let's say somebody in who's just starting college, or it certainly starts making a lot of sense after you've done a few years of work. So you're 27, 28, you have to go to office every day. You will realize very quickly riding a bike in Bangalore or Gurgaon or, 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 or Chennai is not fun, right? Uh, it's absolutely not fun. Like it's just fun for the first month. So many of them end up migrating to schools. So I think there's a very new category emerging, which is which is young and and you would imagine this is would say that my dad would ride a scooter, but their dads are probably also writing the same thing as they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Let me continue. Uh... So there's one question on um... You know, India in general being a follower market, that we are not early adopters to anything. So you take electric vehicles, you, you take any technology, we are, mm -hmm. we are very rarely first adopters, right? right. Why, do you th why do you think that's the case? Because we don't build tech in India. So, so, so I think you're confusing causation and... Uh, so we think India does not adopt new technology because we're not building technology in India. If, if, if the tech is being built by a Taiwanese company or an American company, the American company is not going to rush into India to launch its first new brand new technology, right? It will understand its market first. That's why it's going to launch, right? And 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 hence it will end up launching it at price points or or, or 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 specifications that won't make sense to an Indian customer for a long time, right? Um, also, a lot of tech is often driven by regulation, and Indian regulation in the past has usually run behind, right? So, for example, especially in automotive, most like a ridiculous amount of technology is primarily driven because of a regulation. So BS6 comes in, oh, holy shit, everybody's uh, discovering new technology that was not considered viable before. Suddenly it's viable and sellable and it's perfectly fine, right? Uh, so if the regulations catch up and if we start leading the market on regulations, you will see uh, a new tech emerging out of this market. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's just been an absolutely undisputed space where nobody wants to, nobody's not wants, nobody's attempted building tech in India first, right? Uh, now, the funny thing is, the minute you start putting your thinking hats as to, okay, how can we build tech in this market for our customers, you suddenly start discovering products that just make phenomenal sense. Uh, this is a beautiful example, something I heard uh, many years back, can't name who, but um, Reliance, and I think Reliance actually does not get enough credit for it, but I think Reliance has been the reason behind driving a lot of new tech in India and making India the first early adopter for a lot of stuff. Often behind the scenes, with I think Geo, they are increasingly becoming more and more publicly visible about it. But for example, routers, and not to name companies, but routers are available in the market for I think something like one lakh rupees, okay. Um, you need a new tech to build at a lower price point. What the Reliance do, Reliance was gonna be rolling out Geo. So what the Reliance do, Reliance basically put a whole bunch of stuff together and proved it to its suppliers that you can build the goddamn same thing at 5,000 rupees. Okay, I, I could be out of orders of magnitude, but same, equally, okay. So, so basically, Reliance put something together and showed to suppliers, you can do this at one tenth or one twentieth the cost. And suddenly, the tech became viable, and every company ended up inventing that and ended up building it for Reliance, and we had new tech come in India. 
Okay. So I think the problem has been that we've not had companies willing to take the technology risk in India. I, we've not had Indian companies willing to take the technology bet in India before. There have been very few of them. But as that starts changing, you will certainly see it's not like our customers are technology averse, right? Like, like, uh, do you think you're technology averse? Do you think you look at new technology and say, yeah, let me see what my friends in Slovenia say first, right? Then I'll probably pick it up. You don't have friends in Slovenia. They're never going to tell you anything, right? You will start picking it up the minute it comes in this market. We don't have products coming in this market. Our problem is we are not, we are, we've never been, whether it's technology, whether it's anything, we've never been demand constraint. We have been freaking, we have been supply constraint. Banani there, like we are not building stuff here. So how will people buy? Why will consumers when you're not building it, man? Okay, I, I don't know if I 100% agree with everything you said, uh, <laughs> but you know, you're you're a lot younger than me, Tarun, so you have far more optimism than I do. So I, I, I will just rejoice in that optimism and say, okay, sounds good. Maybe what you say is right and let's hope it's, it's that way. <laughs> with that, let me, um, uh, let me look at what else is asked. Uh, So Raghu from uh, Raghu Tama Rao from Chennai wants to know Tarun, what's one advice that you would like to give to young engineers who are yet to graduate that are thinking of doing their own startup? You know, funny enough, I know Raghu Tama Rao from Chennai. I think I know. I think it's the same Raghu. And if oh, that's okay. the case, I think he has better advice than me. <laughs> 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 uh, but okay, if uh, if I were to put advice. Um, I know, like, is it is specifically for advice for people who want to start up or, or it's just regular career advice? Is I, I think it's specifically for specifically for people who want to start up, for, for would-be okay. entrepreneurs. Okay. okay. Um, so I would say, uh, I think the biggest thing that you have to, like, that this sort of comes up as a question when you're still in college and you're considering entrepreneurship is, do you want to start up while in college or after or, or many years after? Um, and I can make cases both sides. Uh, what I would suggest is do not start up. Absolutely do not start up. Okay. I think you should not start up. If all you want to do is, is start up for the sake of starting up. Because I think that's a very long journey. Uh, so a lot of people want to start up because they want to be independent and they want to be free. It's not impossible, but I think it's a very hard journey because you don't have an idea. You don't have a problem statement. Your passion is to be free. Um, and if you end up taking investments, you're not really free. Okay. If you end up building a team, you're not really free. Right. So unfortunately, building a large company works against your primary starting objective. So if your primary agenda is to be free and not be an employee of somebody, I don't think that's a good enough motivation to be a startup, to be starting up. And if that's the only motivation that you have while you're still in college, and the reason I say that is because I, I think in my own friend circle, I saw a lot of people have that as a primary motivation. I would say maybe try and resist for a while because that's a dangerous place to start up from. Uh, and you could take a long time to sort of figure out what you want to do. And the first 10 years are probably very, very, very critical. Uh, but equally, if you have something that you're passionate about, it could be a space, it could be a problem statement, it could be anything. If you have something that you're passionate about, it's it's never too early to be starting up. Uh, maybe wait till the maybe wait till your final year, but you, you should you don't need to wait for like five, six years, get some experience. You should in my opinion, you should start a base app. Uh, the early years are the most forgiving. Uh, you don't have any. Um, it's it's you, you're not giving up anything. You're not you're not giving up a very big package. In the, in the 22, you're likely not going to be getting a crazy high package. So your cost, um, the opportunity cost is very low, and it's easy to sort of take the risk when you don't think the risk is very high. Uh, once you're 30, you're probably thinking, oh, I could be a manager here. I have this team of 20 people, I'm up for a promotion next year, I have kids, the opportunity cost is too high. It just becomes so much harder to start up. You need to be really strong to start up. Okay, okay. So on, on the startup space, uh, uh, Tarun, do you, you know, do you closely follow the startup space in India? Are there companies that, uh, that you follow? Yeah, yeah. I think there are a lot of really good companies all along. Uh, a couple of them that immediately come to mind, uh, I know this is not the climate for them, but but I've, uh, I've, I've, I've really uh, enjoyed following Cure.Fit's Cure journey. I think uh, what, what those guys are building there is absolutely nuts, how fast they're growing and, and how good a product market fit they have is just, is just phenomenal. And how simple a problem statement, like, like just to offer a better user experience and suddenly, boom, you've unlocked a ton of value. At least that's how I see it. I've not actually used the product yet. Um, and also I've been following Unacademy. I think uh, Unacademy's uh, 
beautiful space, really fast growing. I, I think just hats off to how quickly they've been able to move. Uh, tens of other startups, immediately those two that came to my mind. Okay, okay, nice. I think there are several questions on uh, the R&D that you guys are doing on uh, battery tech. What's next and uh, what are the problems uh, as a team you're focusing on with respect to uh, making the battery technology better and better? Uh, is that something you want to talk about, uh, Tarun? At a very high level, I can. Mm. Uh, so our two key focus areas now in the battery tech are uh, faster charging speed and um, higher higher temperature performance uh i think those are two most important areas to focus on uh lives battery lives already reached a point where there's diminishing returns but a better performance uh sorry um faster charging speed is, is the holy grail now we, we, we are already down to 45 minutes 80 percent uh, if you can bring this down to about 10 15 minutes for 80 percent charge over the next few years i think that really cracks the market okay okay got it um I think there are some prospective customers who want to know when you will go national and when you will cover the different states. You want to take that? I've even saying that. Unfortunately, COVID deleted our plans. Otherwise, we were looking at launching in uh, July uh, uh, this year, uh, looking at starting sales in uh, six and then eventually 10 cities. Uh, that's going to put, get pushed off by a couple of months, but the plan's pretty much right. Uh, we've start, we, we are in the process of appointing dealers. And hopefully, in the next two months, should have a couple of announcements also there. So, Pan India is pretty much happening this year. Okay, terrific, terrific, very nice. So, there's also a question on uh, break even and profitability, and when you expect to uh, become profitable. Is that uh, something you want to take? I've, I've been giving the same answer the last three years. Uh, once we start doing more than 50,000 units per annum, uh, I, I think we are, we are at a good place. Then okay. not be Very good. Uh, I think many of these are repeat questions that, that we've already talked about. So I'm just trying to run through and see if there are ones that we haven't answered yet. Sure. Will Aether Energy launch an electric car? So, actually, I'm like I obviously want to support an electric vehicle, but I'm not super bullish on electric car yet. Um, purely because of the Indian market situation, I, I think uh, the economics for an electric car in India, given our short usage, may struggle for for a while. I'm not saying forever, uh, but but if I were to look at the next two to three years. I'm still not super bullish on electric car for the Indian market, uh, even the premium segment. So maybe after that, but next three, four, five years, I don't think we're going to touch electric car. OK, OK. I think uh, in terms of questions, uh, I my sense is we've covered most of this. So I'm just going to go uh, to the video for a minute, uh, Tarun, and see the, the live chat and see whether there are any questions there that we should look at. Sure. Um, So to those of you that are listening, if you have any other questions, uh, you know, you just uh, need to submit it into the sheet so I can take a look. And uh, in terms of battery density, you know, where does Ether stand as a, as a benchmark? Uh, are you happy with where you are? Are there any numbers you can share? Um, 
So I actually, off the top of my mind, I don't remember battery density, uh, volumetric or weight. Uh, I could calculate, but guys, you can do it on your own. The numbers are all there on our website, honestly. Uh, am I happy with it? Uh, I think we are doing fine right now. Uh, I don't think we are spectacular yet, uh, but I do think we are one of the most energy dense packs in the country uh, for, for this application. Probably the most energy dense application, uh, energy dense in this application. Um, and I'm very, very excited about the next two years. I think we have some really exciting tech coming out, both at the cell level and at the pack level, uh, which should keep continually keep improving this. I don't think I'm going to see a dramatic jump in the next two years, but it's going to keep improving. Uh, already, what we announced this time was a, uh, how much was it? I think it was a 15 to or 20, 15 percent improvement in energy density uh, in, in less than in about a year and a half from launch. Uh, and I think we'll keep improving in that pace for at least a couple of years more. Okay, okay. Yeah. I think there's uh, one more question on something that we uh, uh, discussed uh, a, a little while ago. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the, the method you've adopted is where the battery is integrated with the vehicle and mm. uh, people just go to a charging station to charge the battery. The alternate to it is to allow for batteries to be swapped, where you right. go, you, know, you give a, a battery that's uh, discharged and get a battery that's fully charged. So effectively charging time is practically zero. You, it's just the time taken to swap out the batteries. Nice. Well, how do you see these two approaches uh, and why did Aether go with the former? This is a religious war, man. I think uh, people have some really strong opinions on both sides. <laughs> um, we've actually slipped. Originally, we were uh, a believer in swappable batteries. Uh, that's where we started from. Uh, but at some point, I think around 2015, we flipped and said that no chargeable batteries make more sense. And even to this day, uh, when you look at a consumer application uh, for, a, for a customer uh, with 25, 30 kilometers a day, um, a swapping infrastructure is very expensive. Uh, the people that you need at the stations, the additional cost of batteries, and batteries last just so long that there is no asset utilized. Like, 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 like the cost of capital kills you. Uh, and there is no asset, unlike ride sharing, there's no sharing happening here. Like the asset is still the same. Like, you, like if you have 100 customers, you still need 150 batteries. So it's not like 100 customers with sharing, you will use 30 batteries. So you have more batteries, you have a more expensive infrastructure, you need people at the infrastructure. So overall, it inflates the cost quite a lot. Uh, and for an average consumer, we have not seen the math work yet. Um, just part, like, it's more expensive than using a petrol scooter, simply put. Uh, but I think for a B2B application, like a delivery application, with a lot of kilometers being clocked on a daily basis, with where downtime is absolutely unacceptable, like you can't have even 45 minutes of waiting time, I think swapping plays a role there. And which is why I think we see so many companies working aggressively on it now. Okay, okay, sounds good. Uh, the next uh, uh, one that came up, uh, Tarun, is maybe this is something that several people have asked. Let's say, you know, in, in colleges, they want to do research on electric vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. What are topics that you would suggest? You'd say, what, where, what are problems you'd say, oh, these might be interesting research problems uh, to work on? Uh, can you give us, give some pointers uh, to whoever is listening? I would say uh, it's it's been happening for a long time, but I'm not sure if it's really still practical. Uh, SRM motors, uh, or any motor basically without uh, using uh, rare earth magnets uh, is, an, is a very interesting research area. Um, I would say working on uh, a new kind of a cell tech, uh, solid state uh, could be very interesting, for example. Um, I would say, um, and I think maybe this is the time for people to, Again, start liking power electronics. It's been the, it's been the unlike child. Everybody's been jumping to electronics communication forever. At least I remember my college days. Everybody wanted to go to EC and nobody wanted to go to power. But I think electric vehicles coming in power electronics is is a go. I think that's that's a very exciting space. There's so much work happening with high voltage systems, with super fast chargers, with uh, power, the entire power train is electrical, right? So I think picking up power, any topic. Uh, in power electronics can be very exciting. Um, while it's charging, while it's charging, I, I know it's been on the cusp and a lot of companies have made attempts, but I'm telling you, it's still not practical. So it still needs a whole bunch of innovation. And I don't think students are going to be discovering new things in college. But I think just sort of prepping themselves in these areas and, and being ready, because this is where a lot of new innovation is going to be happening in companies so that they can go join those departments can be very exciting. Okay, okay, nice. Um, 
So one other thing that uh, you know you you've talked about it in other forums and uh, is something I have also benefited from a lot is the value of mentorship, right? Uh, we've right. Uh, you know some of us have been very lucky with uh, the mentors we've had through the course of our career, and many times you know uh, like uh, you pointed out also, right? Startup is a long journey, and the cost of a mistake is so high sometimes, right? Yeah. Uh, again. For somebody that wants uh, access to mentors, right? What 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 what's your uh, uh, input there? How do you suggest? Oh, okay, you're working on a problem. You want access to mentors. Maybe this is something you can do. Reach out. Uh, I should be surprised by how accessible good mentors, people who can be good mentors, are. You'll be surprised by how accessible they actually are. Um, so if you've started putting in some serious work, uh, and and there is serious dedication on your end. You will find help. Or you will find support. Or not help. You will find support or mentorship very, very, very easily available. Um, I think where it goes wrong is when people say, "I want to start up, but I have no help." Like, like this is not like how will you get help? Uh, but you're starting up. You're building this, um, and you're really trying to figure out whether I should bet more on technology or more bet on product. That's a reasonably narrow topic to now sort of go and have an intelligent conversation with. With somebody who can be a mentor, but to say that listen, I wanted to build a startup, but nobody helped me. Like nobody's due to help you. But if you have an intelligent enough question, you will find uh, a lot of people more than willing to sort of share time. Uh, and you have to build a relationship with any mentor. Uh, if they are going to be good mentors, they are going to come in and say in meeting one that listen, here is my price list, here is my equity ask. I'll do this if you do that. Um, they will engage with you because intellectually it's so interesting to engage with you. And as you build a relationship with them over over a couple of years, often that's when you can bring them in as actual mentors, advisors. So just ask. You so, don't need a strong network also for this. Do you think LinkedIn is a good way to get that first uh, step going? Uh, I, I agree with everything else. Uh, see, I think it, it was buffering, huh? Probably it's okay. Okay, okay, uh, tends to happen. Hmm. Uh, I think we're out of time, by the way. Yeah, maybe one last question, and then we will be done. Or maybe not. I'm not able to find the last question. So, good, uh, Tarun. Sounds good, man. Thank you so much for your time. A uh, lot of good points. I'm sure it was very useful for uh, whoever tuned in. Uh, you know, I, I know you're on a long and arduous journey. There are there are lots of people like me that are rooting for your success. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and I I look forward to watching you grow more and more. Thanks so much, Tarun. Thanks, Anupika. It was very nice talking to you. Okay, bye bye. bye.